Hello and welcome to this second lecture in the Dynamics of Structures course and today we are going to investigate one of the most important topics in structural dynamics namely structures exposed to harmonic uh, excitation. Um, so the title is Forced Harmonic Operations and just to put a little bit into perspective we might have again our cantilevered structure or something like this could be could be some kind of monopile founded wind turbine like this and we will have the sea level here and we then have some form of wave excitation sometimes small waves and larger waves but what is representative for this type of environmental loading is that somehow there's a mean period and that means we could instead of this let's say irregular loading, more realistic loading, we could then initially apply constant sinusoidal harmonic load with a constant loading period and this could for instance be represented by sine function or of course a not a cosine but let me put mathematically just a cosine function. So any given harmonic time dependency and then it's applied at the load where your, your natural loading is, is, is applied. Often if you design this idealized harmonic load uh, correctly you will have something that is fairly accurate but in most cases you'll probably like to be a little bit conservative that means at resonance or you apply your load TF so that the structure is what we refer to as in resonance you will have fairly large deflections of your structure and you'll probably be on the conservative side when you design your structure based on these uh, simplified loading conditions. But in many cases, real, actual, natural loading can be replaced, if you're careful, by harmonic uh, excitation and that makes the analysis somewhat easier. Next time, we will then have a look at all the other types of loads, those that are transient. And there are, of course, many cases. So next time we will focus on, on impact loading as one of the non-harmonic load cases that you could encounter in, in real life. To build up our case, we will initially have a look at the undamped structure. In particular, we should be careful about beating. That is something you see in, in nature. Let's get back to that when we reach it. And also, of course, the very important topic of resonance. So this is really a, a devastating excitation scenario where you exactly excite your structure at its natural frequency and in that case you will get very large amplitudes and of course you want to stay within a certain limit on your amplitude so the question is how can we actually improve the, the reduction of amplitude and of course the idea is to have damping in your structure so the next topic the more realistic topic is of course to consider harmonic loading on a structure with damping and here two main points of interest First of all, the so-called frequency response function. The frequency response function is a solution for the steady state behavior of the structure. That is, the behavior of the structure once initial transients have uh, disappeared because of damping. And from that, we are very interested in the so-called dynamic amplification factor, which tells us something about the magnitude of the, uh, of the amplitudes, and in particular, the amplification relative to pure static excitation. And for the amplitude at resonance, we will find a very simple relation. That is, that the dynamic amplification factor is actually equal to 1 divided by the damping in the structure. And that means the larger the damping, the smaller the amplitude. However, if we relate to the undamped structure, for the damping ratio approaching 0, we will, of course, get amplitudes of dynamic amplification factor that, in theory, will approach infinity. So this is, of course, a bad choice bad thing for our structure. So therefore dynamic analysis in particular with respect to harmonic excitation is a very important topic and we consider that today. We will today again consider a single degree of freedom structure. And remember that's a so-called best of structure with a single mass suspended with mass m suspended to the to the ground by a spring with spring stiffness k. And that means our left hand side the equation of motion will be the two-term version with the inertia term given by mass times acceleration and the re restoring force given by k times displacement x. Last, in the last lecture, 
we had a, a zero right hand side, but today we impose an external loading and refer to this loading as F. So it's a time dependent load with a given amplitude and today we will consider a harmonic load in the theory represented by cosine but it could just as well alternatively be by a sine function. So omega is equal to the loading frequency. And of course the loading frequency is not the only frequency we have in our system because when we divide by m in equation 1 we retain the normalized left hand side of our equation and thereby we introduce the natural frequency of our structure and that is equal to the square root of the stiffness divided by the mass. Have a look at lecture number 1 to see how we actually uh, could evaluate stiffness and mass based on some assumed deflection shapes. When we divide by the equation with, with the mass m, we should of course also divide the, uh, the right hand side with m. So let's have a look. That gives us the forcing amplitude divided by mass, and of course also the cosine function. Now, in harmonic uh, excitation and, and response analysis of structures, it's often uh, convenient to introduce the so-called uh, quasi-static response amplitude, or simply the solution to the problem to our equation in, uh, in static analysis. So in, in statics, we ignore the inertia term. That means we have kx divided by f0 and then cosine omega t. So the static solution would then be f0 divided by k, and then the temporal harmonic dependency, and it turns out that this f0 divided by, by k, we could then simply refer to this as f0 tilde in the literature. This is referred to as, as many different things, but it is simply defined as the load intensity f0 divided by the structural stiffness k, and it refers to as the static amplitude, or quasi-static because we have a dynamic problem and we look at very low frequent excitation, that means it becomes that the inertia terms becomes irrelevant, and thereby we only have the restoring force in equation 1 to obtain the static deflection. So it's convenient to introduce this static deflection in the representation of normalized load uh, m magnitude. So we take F0 and we divide by k, that means we also need to multiply by k and divide by m. So it turns out that F divided by m can be written as the static deflection F0 tilde times the natural frequency squared. This you can see on the right-hand side of equation 2. And it's important to note that this F0 tilde will appear uh, during today's lecture, um, regularly during today's lecture, and we'll refer to it as the static deflection. Our equation of motion is therefore a, a second-order ordinary differential equation, but today it is inhomogeneous because we have a non-vanishing right-hand side. So, so this inhomogeneous solution is composed of a homogeneous solution. And that is actually uh, a cosine and sine solution like we had in lecture number five, in lecture number one, with a vanishing, uh, because of a vanishing right-hand side. That's for the unloaded case. And because we have a right-hand side that is non-vanishing today, we should add a particular solution, and we can choose any particular solution we want. Because the right-hand side is a cosine, temporal cosine function, it is convenient to make a guess for the particular solution. Let's refer to that as, as xf, like some kind of constant multiplied by the cosine function. So, I put this xf function into my ordinary differential equation, the inhomogeneous version. That means on the right hand, on the left hand side, I would have to differentiate this twice. So the double derivative of cosine is as well cosine with a change of sign, and omega squared multiplied to it. That means I'll get omega squared minus, then I'll get plus omega zero squared, and I'll have x zero cosine as a common factor on both left-hand side terms. So this goes outside the parenthesis, and this should be equal to F0 tilde 
omega 0 squared cosine omega t. And thereby my x0 becomes omega 0 squared divided by omega 0 squared minus omega f0 tilde. And suddenly we see this factor here becomes a uh, an amplification relative to the static uh, deflection. So um, this one here, this fraction here, will be some kind of dynamic amplification factor, and we will refer to this as the DAF uh, later in this lecture. But I take my x0, stick it back into the solution to xf, and that will give me the expression in, in 3. We can conveniently normalize the particular solution with the static deflection to get a, this ratio between dynamic and static uh, displacements. And of course, it's given by this fraction that we found to the right. Now, this, can, this we can identify as an amplitude of the dynamic, uh, of the dynamic uh, excitation and then a phase change relative to the, to the static solution. And it turns out that the fraction that we have here will either be positive that would be a phase angle of zero. That means that the dynamic solution is in phase with the static solution. Or we could have a change of sign when the second term in the denominator becomes larger than the first term. That means that the excitation frequency becomes larger than the natural frequency. Suddenly we have a switch in sign. It becomes negative. And in terms of phase, this means a phase angle of, of pi. Um, and thus the response will be fully out of phase with the, uh, with the excitation. That means if the excitation amplitude becomes positive, the response is negative, and vice versa. It is obviously the amplitude that is going to break your structure. So in many cases, the uh, identification of the amplitude is the most important part. So that is the absolute value of our uh, particular solution. And it's convenient to plot that uh, as function of, of frequency. And if we divide by f0 tilde, we could actually plot this non-dimensional ratio here, which is given, in this case, by this fairly simple solution uh, containing the natural frequency omega 0 as a constant, and then the variable as, as omega. So if we divide this expression by uh, omega 0, we could write it as 1 divided by 1 minus omega divided by omega 0 squared, sine squared, and in the following we will refer to this ratio as a factor r, also called referred to as the frequency ratio. And we see that we obtain the change in sign exactly when the frequency ratio becomes unity. But in that case, the denominator will vanish, and that means that the amplitude will approach infinity. So actually this curve approaches infinity, uh, telling us that when the loading frequency is equal to the natural frequency, then we'll have an amplitude that in theory approaches infinity. In this case, we refer to as resonance. Exactly when a, when a harmonic load excites the structure at its fundamental natural frequency, then we will get, in this case, because it's undamped, we'll get infinitely large amplitudes. Next, we'll see that damping actually puts a lid on the amplitude and thereby we'll have large, in most cases, but finite amplitudes. In the low frequency uh, area, uh, or range, we see that the, the term that depends on omega here will approach zero. That means that the dynamic amplification factor in the low frequency range becomes equal to one, and that makes good sense because the dynamic amplitude is normalized by the static amplitude, and those become identical for low frequency excitation. Above the resonance frequency, we have a decline in the amplitude as well, simply because this frequency-dependent term in the, uh, in the function, in the, in, the, uh, in the fraction, approaches at large values. So therefore, the entire function here approaches zero. And that is what you see for the behavior uh, for frequencies larger than the natural frequencies. And of course, our main concern in the following will be to investigate what is the amplitude exactly at resonance because that's the devastating part that will, in most cases, destroy your structure 
if you haven't done your analysis correctly. For the phase, we could plot the phase angle also as a function of the frequency ratio. And in the low frequency range below resonance, we will have a phase angle of zero. That means that the response follows the, uh, the response or, or the, the, the behavior of the load. But above, let me move this back. But above the resonance frequency, we will have a jump, or at the resonance frequency, we'll have an ideal jump to a, a change of sign in, in the phase angle, or in, in, the, uh, in the amplitudes, and thereby we will have that the excitation is in opposite phase with the loading, corresponding to a phase angle of pi. Now that we know the, or have analyzed the particular solution, we can actually find the full solution to the inhomogeneous ordinary differential equation. We know that the homogeneous solution is the sum of cosine and sines with two arbitrary constants that we would like to eliminate based on initial conditions. We found that the particular solution is a fraction times the loading cosine, and we then simply multiply these two and apply our initial conditions to obtain C1 and C2. This I've demonstrated in, in greater detail in lecture number one, and you're more than welcome to consult that. What is of interest here is the solution that contains a, an initial term, which you see is directly the uh, particular solution. And then we have and the particular solution with the loading frequency. And then we have two terms, one cosine, one sine, and they both contain the natural frequency. So our response is composed of, of two harmonics one that is based on the loading frequency and the other that contains the natural frequency of the structure. And the devastating part of, of resonance is that in that case omega becomes equal to omega zero, so we have constructive interference between these terms and suddenly we have very large amplitudes and you can also see that in here in the first term and this term inside the first parenthesis we divide by zero, that means we get very large amplitudes in reality. And finally, just to mention that the two initial conditions appear in the two latter terms, and if we start out with uh, an undeformed or a structure in rest, these will cancel because the initial displacement and the initial velocity is often zero, and in many cases with excitation on a dynamic structure, you will most likely also consider the initial conditions to vanish simply because we are in many cases interested in very long loading scenarios where you could apply harmonic load on your structure maybe for 10 minutes and, and after a couple of minutes it doesn't really matter to the structure how the initial conditions were at the beginning of our, our simulation. So in most cases with loading on the right hand side of your equation of motion it's commonly accepted to simply say that the initial conditions should be equal to zero and therefore these terms will, will then vanish in the full solution. But in principle, you could combine loading with initial conditions as you like. But let's have a look exactly at the solution where our initial conditions are equal to zero. That means on the previous slide, we will only have the two terms containing this special fraction as a factor. And those are actually the two cosine terms that you can see here. First cosine will be with the loading frequency. And the second cosine will be with the natural frequency of the structure. Look into your preferred mathematical handbook or web page or mathematical tool and you'll see that a difference of two cosines can be written as the product of two sines where the argument of the first sine function will be the difference, half the difference uh, of the two arguments in the cosine functions whereas the second will be the sum uh, of half of the frequent arguments in the two cosine functions. Now think of this as, as frequencies. Uh, that means that in the first sine function, we will have uh, the difference between two frequencies, and that means we will have a very uh, small frequency corresponding to a very large period, and that means slowly oscillating vibrations. In the second case, we will multiply or add the two frequencies. That means we'll get very large frequency corresponding to a very uh, slow period, and thereby a small period, and thereby fast vibrations. So the solution for zero initial conditions is actually then a uh, multiplication of two types of harmonic response. And it's interplay between these two uh, 
types of solutions that provides us with the full solution and the underlying physical behavior uh, of harmonic resonance or motion. This idea of a slow period and a fast period will then refer to what we could identify as beats. So let's assume that omega is equal to is 10% larger than the natural frequency. That means uh, from the expression in, in 10, we will have for the for the first term, that's, that's omega 0, omega divided by 2, that is minus 0 0.1 divided by 2 omega 0, that's equal to 0, minus 0 0.05 omega 0. And that means the period of the of this slow uh, vibration will be approximately 20 natural periods. However, the second term, that's the sum of these two, that would be 5 omega 0, that means approximately omega 0. So, you will have a fast vibration, and this period here will actually be your, very close to your regular natural period of your structure. However, on top of that, you will have in this drawing only a single period. And you can see that you will approximately have 10 periods within the first half period, 10 fast periods within the second half. So in total, you will have 20 T0 periods uh, within, within this large, single uh, and slow period. And this phenomenon of a fast vibration inside a slow vibration is then what we refer to as beating, a beating behavior. And that is when you have two frequencies in your solution, in this case, a loading frequency and a natural frequency. And they're typically close to each other. Now, what will happen when the loading frequency approaches the natural frequency? This means that this slow period will actually approach uh, infinity. So as omega approaches omega zero, we will extend this linear increase. And actually, we will end up by getting simply an infinite linear increase in amplitude. So this will approach infinity, but it will do so uh, linearly. And this is what we refer to as resonance. So the, go back, so the infinite amplitude that we see exactly for omega equal to omega zero will not happen immediately, but it will happen in time and it will be governed by a linear increase in amplitude. And that is very characteristic of resonance, at least for, for a single degree of freedom uh, system. Now, this linear increase towards infinity is, of course, unphysical. So, in reality, yes, we will have an increase, but at some point, we will then branch off and get a constant amplitude. So, I just extend my domain here, and at this point, we will have oscillations with a constant period, but as well with a constant amplitude. And this regime is what we refer to as steady state, or in some cases also stationarity, although this is more referred to in the uh, within stochastic dynamics. And this uh, limit to the increase in amplitude is, of course, due to what we haven't considered yet, namely damping in the structure. So for damped, for a damped structure, or the response or harmonic excitation of, of a damped structure, we will introduce the damping term on the left-hand side by c times the velocity x dot. We then divide by m and get the term containing the damping ratio, and on the right-hand side we will still introduce our quasi-static deflection, f0 tilt. As we saw for the undamped case, much of the information is actually present directly in the particular solution. So it's, it's very convenient to only have a look at the particular solution because the amplitude that we saw during steady state, that we will see during steady state, uh, 
is then entirely given by the particular solution for our uh, ordinary differential equation. So therefore, it's of special interest to initially have a very close look at the particular solution. Now, our ordinary differential equation in 12 now contains a velocity term. That means our full solution will be a, a combination of, of a sine and a cosine. So we'll have a, a more advanced, a more elaborated phase dependency in, in our solution. So therefore, it is actually uh, convenient to, instead of using cosines and sines, to simply use the full complex uh, solution, that's the exponential function, to an argument i omega t, where, of course, you can expand this into a cosine and a sine. And the cosine will actually be the real part of this full complex function. So instead of assuming a particular solution with a cosine, we will consider a particular solution to the real part of the full exponential function. The particular solution xf is then given correspondingly as a real part to the solution function that we had previously, x0 times the exponential function. Now, previously, x0 became a real function. It could be either be positive or negative, depending on whether the loading frequency was below or above the resonance frequency. But because we now have a damping term, it actually turns out that x0 becomes a full complex uh, number. So a complex number can be written by its, uh, by its magnitude and then the phase angle, like we did uh, for the undamped case. So this absolute value of x0 we will actually refer to as a. So this will be the amplitude. And as already indicated, here a will actually be the physical amplitude that you could measure during steady state in your response. If you were able to measure your deflection at resonance, you could identify a as the amplitude during the steady state response, where you have a constant period and a constant deflection or deflection amplitude in principle. Back to the solution. We substitute in a and then the exponential function with the, uh, with the phase angle, and we can move a outside the real uh, evaluation simply because a is a real value, and we can combine the two exponential functions to get omega t minus the phase angle, and then we can evaluate the real part again and see that our particular solution is given by an amplitude a, and then a cosine function not with omega t, but with omega t minus a phase angle that represents the delay of the response relative to the loading. And, of course, the uh, modular representation of the complex value identifies a as the magnitude of x0, and the phase angle is determined as the tangent to the angle, and then the ratio between the imaginary, unit, uh, imaginary part and the real part of this complex uh, response amplitude x0. In terms of a vector diagram, you could consider a real axis as the real part and a vertical axis as the corresponding imaginary part. And let's assume that at a given time instant, we will have a loading vector that is located in this complex plane because its argument omega t has evolved so that we are now at the green arrow in, in the complex plane. Now the response will then trail the displacement. So that is simply due to, to causality. So we cannot have a displacement that precedes the loading because this, uh, the displacement can only occur once the loading has acted. So we will always talk about a phase delay. So x is always following, trailing uh, f. And when f as a vector is moving around in the complex plane, we will have that the displacement will then follow f at this given phase angle phi. So the question is, how can we find x0? And then from that, how can we find the amplitude and the phase angle? So our solution x is then expressed again, as we remember, as a complex, full complex exponential solution with displacement x0 and natural frequency or constant frequency omega. It's not necessarily the natural frequency of our system. We then express this in terms of the amplitude, 
and the face angle or the face delay fine and the loading remember was was initially represented as a load amplitude and then the uh, exponent complex exponential function so what is new on this slide is that we ignore the real part simply because we know that at the end if we want to find our solution we should take the real part but in principle we are looking not for the real part but we're looking for the amplitude and the phase angle and then we know from the vectoral uh, diagram that the amplitude is simply the length of these individual vectors so we substitute this into our equation of motion and we will on the left hand side have the acceleration term that provides us with minus omega squared we'll have the stiffness term and in here we will have the damping term so let's just go to a blank page and see how we actually find this expression the uh, differential equation okay, let me just It's then given as x double dot to theta omega zero x dot plus I need the natural frequency squared in here x and that's equal to f zero till the static deflection omega zero squared and remember that in this case we will then have the full complex representation of the harmonic dependency of the loading. We are looking for solutions of the same form. That means that the velocity is given by i omega x0 and the acceleration is then i omega squared x0 and the exponential solution and of course the square of the imaginary unit is minus 1 and we have omega squared x0 i omega t. So we stick that into the left hand side of our, <coughs> sorry, of our equation and the first term will then be omega squared, the second term will be 2 theta omega 0 i omega, and the last term will be omega 0 squared because x0 and the exponential function is a common factor on all three terms. And on the right hand side we'll have the static deflection, natural frequency squared, and then the exponential function. We can roughly say cancel the exponential functions and thereby we can isolate Press our left hand side as omega squared with the minus plus, and then we commonly add the imaginary term after the number two. So we get a theta omega zero omega omega zero squared capital X zero static deflection omega zero squared. And we then isolate omega x zero, but we could actually normalize that by dividing with the static deflection like we did for the undamped case. That means we will get a fraction on the right hand side. In the numerator we will have the natural frequency squared and in the denominator we will have minus omega squared plus 2i theta omega 0 omega plus omega 0 squared. And this ratio we will refer to as the frequency response function and it identifies the uh, represents particular solution to the ordinary differential equation that we've listed at the top of this slide. So we're back uh, on slide 8 where we can identify the complex amplitude x0 as a function multiplied by the static deflection and this function we have just identified as the frequency response function and this will get italic font, blue font and even a box indicating that that in structural dynamics is a very important result, a very important function. For H approaching unity which will happen for omega approaching zero, we will recover 
x0 equal to f0 tilde. That means statics. So again, this h refers to the somehow the dynamic amplification of uh, our structure because of the harmonic exposure by the loading. So again, f0 tilde equals 1 refers to unit, unit static deflection and the frequency response function will give the, uh, the response amplitude in this particular normalized case. We are of course interested in the amplitude. So the amplitude is given as the absolute value of x0. Now x0 is composed of a real part and an imaginary part. So from mathematics you know that the absolute value will be the square root of the sum of real and ima imaginary parts squared. So it's convenient to actually find the real value and the imaginary value of h. To do so, let's go back to the blank page. So this we have now identified as the frequency response function, and it represents a, a complex uh, number. The problem is that the imaginary part is, is buried in the, uh, in the denominator. So what you do is that you multiply the denominator, and we can write it slightly different, namely by collecting the real to real terms first, and then the imaginary term last. Then we multiply by the complex conjugate of the denominator. That means we should also multiply the the numerator by the same factor. And it turns out that a complex number multiplied by its complex conjugate can be expressed as its real part squared plus its imaginary part squared, which will then be 2 zeta omega 0 omega squared. In the, uh, in the numerator, we'll have a real part that is given as omega 0, omega 0 squared minus omega, and we'll have a negative imaginary part, 2i zeta omega 0 to the power 3 omega. And these you can see here at the bottom of slide A. So what we're going to do to find the amplitude is to plot these expressions into the definition of an amplitude, and in many cases it might be initially more convenient to consider the amplitude squared, because then you get rid of the, uh, of the square root. Let's uh, have a look at, at, this, um, at this amplitude. So, we have the frequency response function given here. So I would like to obtain the square of the absolute value of this frequency response function because I will then have to take the square root to actually uh, identify its magnitude directly. So this means I take the real value and I square that and then I add the square of the imaginary unit. They have a common denominator so that means I can simply uh, make a large line here and take the square of the denominator, so large parenthesis, inside omega minus this plus 2 zeta omega 0 omega, and this should also be squared, and this should be squared even further. Then we take the square of the real part, that's omega to the power of 4, and then it's the difference squared c squared like this plus the imaginary part squared gives me two zeta omega zero and out of these three I only take one of them as you can see and add inside the square that means I still have omega squared left need to square that square of square gives me the power of four so I can actually isolate the common factor omega to the power of four Take that outside the parenthesis, and inside I'll get like this, which is actually 
identical to what is inside a large parenthesis in the denominator. So I can cancel this one by reducing the power of 2 to a power of 1. And that means the my absolute value of h squared becomes omega to the power of 4, and then I'll have omega 0 squared, and then 2 theta omega 0 omega squared. Then I take the square root to find the absolute value in the numerator. This will simply give me the natural frequency squared, but in the denominator you need to apply the square root to get the correct amplitude. And this will actually be the absolute value of x0 divided by the static displacement, and that is the physical amplitude that you, that you measure divided by the static deflection. And this ratio, dynamic amplitude relative to static amplitude, we define as the dynamic amplification factor. So if you apply your load without the cosine function, and you do a static analysis and find a given deflection, then you can multiply with the dynamic amplification factor to find the corresponding amplitude of an increased amplitude you will find at uh, when you impose your loading uh, dynamically by for instance by for instance a sine function or a, a uh, cosine function and this is summarized in this large blue box in equation 22 where the steady state amplitude in dynamic analysis divided by the static amplitude just demonstrated that is the absolute value of our frequency response function and that can be written as this expression here which is exactly what we just derived we could divide this expression here with omega 0 squared. That will give us a unit factor in the numerator, and it turns out that we get a very simple expression inside the square root, only containing the damping ratio theta, and instead of omega and omega 0, we will get the ratio between the two of them. That means we get the frequency ratio between the loading frequency and the natural frequency of the structure. This A, dynamic amplitude or static amplitude, as mentioned previously, we refer to as the dynamic amplification factor. In some cases, you will also see it as the dynamic magnification factor. So either it's a DAF or just a DMF. Now that we have found the, the amplitude, we are, of course, also interested in the, in the phase angle. And the phase angle represents minus the argument of our frequency response function, and similarly, to the undamped case, it's obtained as minus the ratio between the imaginary and the real part of this frequency response function. And it's given by this very simple relation here. So for very slow frequencies, small frequencies, close to the static limit, we see that omega here approaches zero. That means that in the low frequency range, we will have a phi angle that is approaching zero, whereas in the high frequency domain, uh, we will get something that changes sine, and it will approach pi in the high frequency limit. Now, for the undamped case, we had a very hard transition. So, exactly at the resonance frequency, we had a switch between phase angle 0 and phase angle pi. When we introduce damping, we will immediately see a much smoother transition. So, for instance, for the red curve, we will have an increase in the phase angle, even for frequencies below the, uh, the resonance frequency, and it will approach exactly pi, uh, pi half, sorry, up here, at resonance, and then go smoothly, that's the buzzword here, towards pi in the high frequency uh, range. So resonance simply means that we'll have a phase angle of pi half, uh, that means we have a 90 degree phase angle between our uh, response and the loading. And in principle, that means that at resonance, we will have that the load is in phase, not with displacement, but with the velocity component. Simply because the velocity 
is 90 degrees ahead of displacement. So at resonance, the loading would then be in phase with this velocity component of the structure. And that is exactly what gives us the large uh, excitation amplitudes when we excite exactly at the natural frequency of our structure. For the amplitude, we again plot the normalized amplitude uh, relative to the static amplitude in a frequency response diagram. And that means at zero frequency, we will uh, have unit value for our dynamic amplification simply because we divide by the static deflection. Then when we increase the frequency, we will also have an increase in amplitude and we will gradually increase the amplitude for very small damping, here, a damping ratio of 5%. We will have a very large uh, amplitude, but it's not approaching infinity. For the blue curve with 10% damping, which by the way is an enormous damping ratio, so we only use this here to have fairly illustrative figures. In reality, the red curve is much more realistic than the blue curve. We will have a maximum value exactly, seems at least, at the resonance frequency. And beyond that, we will then have a decay in the amplitude. So again, the question is max amplitude exactly at resonance. That's omega equal to omega zero or r equal to, to one. The larger the damping, you see the magenta curve, we have a smaller amplitude, so we can reduce the amplitude by increase the damping in our structure. If we do not have sufficient damping inside the structure itself, we will have to add external damping by, for instance, dampers placed on the structure. Have a look at the Millennium Bridge and, and see the dampers underneath the bridge. We also, you could also have a look at the Taipei 101 uh, high-rise building where we have a pendulum damper uh, at the top of the building, those are all measures to uh, reduce the amplitude even further and thereby maybe increase comfort or maybe even secure the structural integrity of the structure. So the question we could ask ourselves now, now that we know that at resonance the maximum amplitude is what we're looking for, what is actually the amplitude at resonance? So let's just carry on with the expression for the dynamic amplification factor. And we have the normalized loading frequency relative to the natural frequency. So we simply differentiate the dynamic amplification factor with respect to this non-dimensional frequency and set that equal to zero. That means we're looking for extreme parts. And that gives us this expression here. And you can solve that for the frequency ratio squared equal to one minus two times the damping ratio squared. Then I take my R and I plug that back into the expression for the amplitude, and I get this solution here for the maximum uh, dynamic amplification factor, assuming that we have small damping. So there's a, a transition point where the maximum would actually be at, in the static limit. But of course, we're not interested in that. If that is the case, then we have no dynamic problems at all. In most cases, the damping ratio is quite small. And in that case, this is the exact maximum uh, at this shifted natural frequency. So if we go back one slide, I mentioned that the resonant or the maximum would be apparently at the, uh, at the maximum frequency, but it is actually shifted a little bit into the low frequency domain. In most cases, of course, this is approximately equal to omega zero, and that is then r equal to one. But in principle, it's shifted a little bit. And furthermore, if we assume that this damping ratio is much smaller than one, then we can simply cancel the square root out of convenience, simply to get this extremely simple relation. And it tells us that the height of the peak in the dynamic amplification factor is one divided by two theta. This, of course, shows that this peak will approach infinity for theta approaching zero, so for vanishing damping. We know we should recover infinity amplitude, and we do so as well by this simple equation. And you can see for 10% damping, we actually get a dynamic amplification factor of 5. That matches well. 1 divided by 2 times 10. That is 1 divided by 0 0.2. And that is 5. If we double the damping to 20%, an enormous value, we will get 2.5 for the dynamic amplification. So although it's not an exact maximum, it's something that is very accurate, even 
for very unrealistic damping ratios of 20%. So therefore, this even requires a third frame like this, because it's one of the very important relations that you, uh, that you can use. Of course, if you want to find the actual amplitude in your response, that's A, you should take the 1 divided by 2 zeta, and you need to multiply by F0 tilde. And remember that F0 tilde is 1 divided by is F0 divided by the stiffness. So if you know the damping ratio, if you know the magnitude of your load and the stiffness of your structure, you can actually estimate the maximum amplitude at resonance, and you can verify by, by finding the stresses in your structure that you stay below some kind of maximum value or, or fatigue value for your stress level. Let's have a, a more qualitatively look at the frequency response function and the dynamic amplification factor. So, as we probably realize now, the left-hand side can be decomposed into three regimes. In the low-frequency regime, it's actually stiffness that dominates, because the motion is very slow. That means when we normalize by the static deflection, we will have a dynamic amplification factor of unity. In the high-frequency range, that's out here, we will have very fast motion, that means that accelerations become dominant, and that means that the inertia term on the left-hand side of the equation of motion becomes the, the dominant uh, term that can be used to estimate the solution. And this is then proportional to omega squared, so if we want to find the amplitude, we need to divide by omega squared. And that is why we have a decay, a decline in amplitude, because we get omega squared in the denominator. In between the stiffness domain and the inertia domain, we have the domain determined by damping, because at resonance, sorry, exactly at resonance, we will have that inertia and stiffness, they cancel. So the only term left is then given, uh, is then the damping term. So in between, we have the damping dominated part, and because damping is low in basically all stress, we will have a large amplitude, because of low damping. And we have realized that the maximum amplitude of our dynamic amplification factor is approximately equal to 1 divided by 2 times the damping ratio. What is commonly assumed is that the damping domain is bounded by a box. So if you talk to professionals and peers, you will often talk about the bandwidth of your frequency response function. And it turns out that you take your dynamic amplification factor and you divide by the square root of 2. And here you will have two values that will allow you to build a fictitious box that defines, that is bounded by the maximum of your dynamic amplification factor. And it turns out that the width of this box is equal to two times the damping ratio. Very lightly damped structures. It's a very narrow box, and these two, these two plus minus limits of the frequency that define the that define the, the bandwidth is actually approximately given by this value here. So, if you take the distance between them, the first term here will cancel, and you'll get two times the damping ratio. It's more complicated. You see the approximation signs here, so it's based on the Taylor expansion of the initial square root. But again, for all practical purposes, this is quite uh, exact. Have a look, because the height is 1 divided by 2 zeta, the width is 2 zeta, so the area underneath this one is equal to unity. So the damping bandwidth box is simply a unit area box that becomes narrower as damping decreases, but also taller with a reduction in damping. And in principle, you would like to increase damping so that you reduce the amplitude, but then you also increase the bandwidth. So it has some kind of water bed effect. If you pull it down or push it down, it also becomes wider. And that is something you see. So there's nothing really like a, a free lunch. If you reduce the amplitude at, at, at resonance, you will actually somehow increase the amplitude outside the, uh, the resonant bandwidth or the damping bandwidth of your dynamic amplification factor. The full solution can be written in terms of our particular solution, and then we also have a homogeneous solution with two 
arbitrary constants, and then you can eliminate C1 and C2 by the initial conditions, and if you choose to represent your amplitude in terms of the dynamic amplification factor, you will see that in the first two terms, we will have the uh, particular solution with A and the frequency omega, and in the remaining uh, terms, we will have cosines and sines, not uh, with argument omega, but with argument omega d, which you remember is the natural frequency shifted by the damping ratio. So, of course, this will be the damped natural frequency. Have a look, John. Have a look at, at lecture number one. So, for damping approaching zero, you will recover the undamped response that it had in the uh, initial part of today's lecture. And the interesting part is actually the final bullet here. Let time uh, increase. Yes, it says infinity here, but in principle, consider this solution as time increases. The terms in the two bottom rows are all proportional to this exponential function. And this exponential function, we remember from the damped free response, will then approach zero for time approaching infinity. So with time, these terms will actually be become of less importance, and after sufficient time, they will actually be uh, non-visible. So the solution that we are left with for time approaching infinity, or if we wait long enough, will actually be the, uh, the particular solution with amplitude A, phase angle phi, and a period uh, determined entirely by the loading frequency. And if we go back to my, my initial drawing here for the undamped case, where I argued that it would be unphysical to have an infinite amplitude, and that we at some point would branch off to get something that becomes constant, it turns out that the period will be 2 pi divided by the loading frequency. And the amplitude is given as the static deflection times the dynamic amplification factor, which is then the static deflection times the absolute value of the frequency response function. And this part we refer to as steady state. So let's have a look at, at an example. We uh, consider 2% damping in the structure, and then we excite the structure exactly at resonance in the middle figure. We could, and this is uh, a simply, simply a time simulation using the time step function that I introduced in lecture number one. We see immediately that this is resonance because we have this linear increase in amplitude. But instead of uh, continuing the linear increase towards infinity, we will, because of damping, have a branching off of the amplitude, and we will approach A that is equal to the dynamic amplification factor multiplied by the static deflection. Now, since we actually have normalized our response here by the static deflection out of convenience, in reality, of course, you, you'll have your attitude in, in, in SI units, but in this case, we have normalized it. I can actually erase this. And because I know that I am at resonance, this is 2 theta because omega is equal to omega 0. And that means we have 2, 0 0.02, that is 1 divided by 0 0.04, and that is 25. And that's actually what you see here at the curve. So after some time, not time approaching infinity, we can see here how many periods do we need. We might need 20 periods or something like that because before the initial part has vanished, uh, the part depending on the initial conditions, the part that I have erased here, and then we can simply evaluate the amplitude directly at steady state. And this amplitude you can obtain analytically from the frequency response function. Now, what if we reduce the frequency slightly? Only 5% relative to the natural frequency. First of all, we see initially a build-up again, then we have a branching off, 
But it actually turns out that we have some kind of beating type transient in the beginning, which indicates that we have a loading frequency that the, does not directly match the natural frequency. So in this case, we have two distinct omegas, and that should give some kind of beating behavior. Now, this beating behavior would continue in the case without damping. But again, because we have damping, we will move into steady state behavior. And we will here have an amplitude that is equal to 10. And that means it's more than half or less than half of the resonance frequency. So again, the amplitude for this slightly reduced frequency is much more than the amplitude at that we measure at resonance. Now let's instead try to increase the frequency by 5%. And we have very similar behavior. Initially, some kind of beating behavior, and then we end up at a steady state amplitude that is smaller than that at, uh, at resonance. And again, a factor of more than 2. Let's just go back to, to, uh, to this this function here. Uh, let's have a look at the red curve. The amplitude will, of course, maximum point will be in uh, in 10. So that will be around here. So we will go up and go down like this. That would probably be the, the red curve. So exactly at resonance, we have an amplitude up here. But it's also a very steep curve. So even a reduction of the frequency by 5% will imply that we end up maybe down here. And an increase by 5%, similarly, because it's almost symmetric, it's not entirely symmetric around unity, we will also have a substantial reduction of our amplitude. So because for lightly damped structures we also have a very narrow bandwidth, a small change in the frequency will impose a very drastic reduction in the, natural fre in the, in the amplitude. Conversely, if you have a loading that is close, with a frequency close to the natural frequency, you might have a very limited amplitude, but only when it changes slightly towards the natural frequency, maybe even exactly approaching the natural frequency, suddenly you could have an increase in amplitude of more than a factor 2, 3, or 4, depending on the damping in your structure. And that is why resonance at the peak of the dynamic amplification factor is such a dangerous phenomenon. You could suddenly have two or three loading conditions at the resonance frequency, build up of resonance, your stresses go beyond the capacity of your structure, and you have full collapse. So this ultimate limit uh, condition is something that you should be very careful about when you, for instance, build your offshore wind turbine in the North Sea, uh, or expose your your, uh, your cable state bridge or your suspension bridge to, uh, to particular wind conditions. I will leave the uh, base excitation to, uh, to yourself and uh, also the summaries. And just uh, one more time stress that the uh, theory behind the harmonic excitation of structures is very important because many fairly complicated loading cases are actually, uh, because of simplicity, then replicated or, or, or emulated by an idealized harmonic response. Uh, so you'll actually use the theory behind the frequency response function quite extensively if you're going to work with structural dynamics.